Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the next episode of the Jason's Take On. My name is Jason Whitehead, coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and my co-host, Jason Noble, over in the U.K. And today we're really hey guys. Good morning. to have our uh, a guest here, a great guest, Shanta Bowden. And Shanta is a leader uh, in customer success at a company called Supply Shift. And Supply Shift helps organizations achieve and manage supply chain transparency, which you know, I'm really, really interested about hearing more about this. And you know, we're always looking for people to be bold in customer success. And Shanta has some great experience and ideas. So we're really excited to welcome her here today. And she's going to share her insights and her thoughts about moving past whoever purchased your product to really get end users to adopt it. And this is obviously an important topic that looks at how, how we can do all these things. And we're really excited to have you here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Thanks so much. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, when we first connected, I was very intrigued to hear about your background in customer success and HR and diversity. And, you, you know, you have a really interesting background that blends a lot of different perspectives. Uh, can you go ahead and just sort of tell everyone about your career and your unique slant on customer success, just to give a little perspective here? Yep, absolutely. So when I first started my career, I thought I had found my life's work in human resources, not customer success. <laughs> so that was kind of my first career. And HR was very fulfilling for me. You know, obviously part of the HR role is to promote diversity and equality in the workplace, which is something that I feel very strongly about and really resonate with. And, and when you do that in human resources, you really help to make a difference in the employees' lives and the company that you work for mm -hmm. in an in-house role. Eventually, I made more of a shift to HR consulting roles and then for an, an HR SaaS company. And gradually, I realized that you can really make a broader impact through that type of model. So you're working with different companies, you're working with different organizations. And so working with multiple companies gives you a broader reach. And you learn more because you're experiencing a lot of different challenges that different companies bring to you. So that was really something that resonated with me as I moved through my career. And that's really what led me to customer success. So currently, I work for a company called Supply Shift, and we are a supply chain transparency company, and I work in customer success there. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. I love that. That journey, I think, is, is really exciting. And I, I love people that have you find people who've got the experience have come from lots of different areas in customer success. And I think it really gives a really strong all rounder perspective on the wider business and understanding customer challenges. I, and I, and I, I love kind of that background around HR. It's quite a unique one. Mm -hmm. I, think. I don't think I know many people that have come from the HR side, but, but it is gives you a very, I think, unique perspective on, on kind of the employee side of it and how, how the employee engagement really helps. At, at your current company then, so Supply Shift, I mean, you guys yourselves are quite unique in providing those services to manage supply chain security and, trans and transparency. And, and I think if you look at where we are now in the middle of a global pandemic with all the challenges we're seeing globally here, I mean, how, how do you, what are the big challenges that you guys are helping organizations with? And have you seen things like COVID and the pandemic help? Have they kind of pushed people in different directions with you? Have you seen it change business, changing your customers' perceptions there? Yeah, it's really been interesting um, over the past few months. So basically what we do is we are a SaaS company that provides supply chain visibility software. And we have really two angles to that. And the first is risk mitigation and the mm -hmm. second is sustainability. The two both lead to better financial outcomes. There's, there's really no question there. The angle that you take really depends on you know, where your company is at and, and how you are trying to address supply chain visibility. And, and something that I really think came to light with COVID was the realization that folks don't have a lot of visibility into their supply chain. And even if they do understand what that top level of their suppliers are and, and where they reside in the world, they may not have information deeper in their supply chain. And, and that's really where um, the rubber meets the road in terms of how are you going to get certain things in order to, to, to continue your business and affect your customers. So, you know, we, we really take both angles and what we've really learned is aside from the risk mitigation, the sustainability also has a form of risk mitigation as well, because, you know, the insights that you gain through sustainability, protect your business, protect people and protect the planet. And we've really realized that today's consumers really are different and, and really care about how their products are sourced and where they're made. 
And so we believe that when properly managed, strong and resilient supply chains really change the world for the better. And that's where we've kind of seen that evolution come across with COVID-19 as well. You know, folks are, are really putting a spotlight on supply chain transparency and, and how it can help their business too. That's great. Now, when you and I chatted, you, you also talked a little bit about sort of who uses your software and your application and how that goes. And it sounds like it's not just your direct customers that use it, but also their suppliers and, 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 and so forth down the line as well, too. Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. So we have, we work with the Fortune 500 companies, give or take, that use our software directly and they send information to their suppliers. And so our suppliers are also users of our software. So we have a really broad reach and kind of a, a network almost in terms of who actually is adopting and using our software on a regular basis. Right, yeah, because I think that really tees up really what we were starting to look at for this topic here. And, and you shared a, an interesting article and thank you for that. Uh, we'll put a link to it by, by Ravi Dhaliwal uh, that talks about some of the key challenges in CS. And, and one of the, I thought was an interesting distinction that you brought up was the distinction between the buyer and the deployer. and you know, whoever buys the software may just chuck it over the fence and, and tap someone and say, hey, it's your job to go and do something with this. And, and they sort of, you know, bounce them out, you figure it, figure it out. And so it's not always the person who really makes that purchasing decision, who's then responsible for getting, getting live, getting people to use it, make sure they're getting value from it. And what you just described, where you have your customers and their suppliers, you know, there are several layers down the chain here um, before mm -hmm. people that you need to get to use the technology. So I'd love to hear, you know, what are some of the challenges that you see people often face, you know, or that you face with your customers getting everyone to use the challenge, the, the, the tools well and effectively to, to really create that level of success through the use of the, of the tools? Yeah, you know, this is, this is something that I've seen in many SaaS companies. So, you know, there's folks at the top who generally make the buying decisions and then they kind of hand off the implementation, like you mentioned. So sometimes the folks who are actually doing the deployment kind of feel like they've inherited a project. So, you know, you can have the best, most sophisticated solution, <laughs> but if somebody isn't invested and they don't feel ownership, then you don't really have the right pieces in place to be successful, right? So mm -hmm. I think that this is really where change management and changing behavior really plays a role in engagement. And, and this is kind of an interesting tie back to human resources again, because there's a, a strong drive when you're shifting a company, whether it's you know the company culture or you're rolling out a new program, or you're even establishing a new department and trying to figure out how that integrates with the whole there's a lot of behavior change that's involved with that process. And really at the end of the day is it's, you know, how do you how do you understand the person who's on the other end of making those changes, who's expected to implement those things and what's important to them and how can they achieve their goals? And really understanding that and enabling them to do better is what I've seen really lends itself to success. Yeah, I, know, I, I so like what you're saying about the HR piece too. You know, when I was, I did a master's in organization development and human resources. And while I never worked in the HR office, you know, there was so much around everything you just talked about in there. And one, I've brought some of those questions and those skills and that perspective into customers that are implementing systems and say, you know, whose job is it to make sure this is a success? And is it formal part of their, their compensation? Is it formal part of their evaluation? Do they have what the tools and resources they need? Everyone's like, no one's ever asked us that before. And the simple idea that you should be bringing HR to the table to help make your IT a success is really foreign to folks, but I think it's absolutely critical. So it's, it's great to hear you talk about that and that focus on behavior. Very cool. I think the other really interesting thing you mentioned this idea about change management and I think it's a, it's a massive piece with any anything we're doing in customer success but just generally a lot of IT projects now about big transformations and you you often forget about the the change that's got to occur at an organization level at the buyer level and at the deployer level and I, I'd love to hear when you when you've seen kind of big distances between the buyer and the deployer what are some of the things that you found helpful to close that gap and help create success? And what sort of things have you found that haven't worked so well there? Yeah, so, you know, the biggest thing that we've found that does work well is finding that common mission with your deployer that, that they really care about. So identifying what their goal is. And for us, you know, we can just take the sustainability aspect. Sustainability is, is a broad topic. And when you're talking about, you know, something that a deployer or a company in a company really cares about that could be, you know, deforestation, that could be climate change, it could be preventing modern slavery, it could be diversity, trying to pick out what that key component is, and, and really like what makes them tick, 
and how they can be seen as a hero in their organization and how you can enable them to get there is, is a really big part of understanding how they can be successful. So once you can find that goal, linking their actions back to that goal is a really big part in, in closing that gap and helping them understanding at helping them to understand the why before the how basically is, <laughs> is really key. And that's, that's again, that's true in, in HR just as well as customer success. So when you're talking about employee engagement um, and, and how you can help employees be successful, helping employees understand the why and how they can link their day-to-day -day back to your company goals and corporate goals is really key. So that's something that I found works really well is just putting yourself basically in, in the people's shoes of who is who's yeah. actually doing the deploying and what makes them tick and, and what their goals are. Yeah, no, I think that's that why quite often can be really difficult, isn't it? And I think we, we've said before, right. Jason, that a lot of people, particularly coming into success, aren't equipped to ask questions about the why and just crack on with the, the do rather than understanding, well, why are we doing this? What's the reason behind this? What are your goals and objectives? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that kind of feeds into the second part of your question, which is, you know, what, what doesn't work well. And, yeah. and that's, that's what I've seen is, you know, when you're, you're trying to implement a solution or, or a tool without thought to the folks that are expected to use it, it, it really doesn't lend itself well to setting them up for success. So for example, if you're designing a survey, let's say mm -hmm. that you have a certain set of information that you want, and the survey is that tool or mechanism to get that information. And if you design, for example, a hundred question survey of all text responses, the person on the other end isn't going to be very inclined to fill it out because it right. sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really burdensome and, and they're gonna have survey fatigue. Now, if you put some thought to refining some of those questions and you cut that down to poll surveys and say, for example, you mix in some multiple choice questions, you know, now you've probably got some more actionable information and that person can actually accomplish the goal that you're setting out for them. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that, I think that's so important too, to really think about that and think how the other person's going to encounter that. And, and so many folks I've seen roll through and just try to do what they've always done without a real thought to, is this yep. going to move the needle? And as I say, you know, looking for the best answer to the wrong questions here is, is kind of the situation. You know, uh, one of the things that was in the article that you shared that I really liked too, is they were talking about how many times buyers of software, like your customers, or don't necessarily have the skills or experience in-house to really drive change and drive adoption, drive success on their own. And, and many CS teams make the mistake of just sort of plowing ahead. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how many people would buy a software without really planning for how they're going to get that value it, and, and make sure they have that. Um, and I'm curious to hear your take on this since you work with so many customer organizations. You know, what do you think are the reasons that so many buyers do this and will throw things over the fence? And what do you think it will take for buyers organizations to really change how they approach purchasing and deploying software and achieving success with it, you know, within their organization? Yeah. So for us, many of our customers are working with manual processes. And mm -hmm. so I think that when you look at working with a manual process and you're shifting that to technology, many companies kind of look at technology as something that will fix the problem as a standalone solution. And, and let's be honest, technology obviously does solve problems. That's, yep. that's why we're, we implemented it. And that's why <laughs> that, that we can succeed with it. But, you know, I, I agree with you in, in many cases, they just kind of throw something over the fence or slap something in place without the proper preparation for the people that are working with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's really why addressing behavior change is so important. You know, there's lessons to be learned from other business leaders with experience in other fields and how you can apply that to drive adoption within your business and within customer success. Very cool. Are there any particular techniques that you found helpful or that some customers gravitate towards around you know, changing behaviors in particular? Because I think a lot of people think of, think first of deploying technology and in, 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 think of behavior later or they don't think of it at all. And, and it's great to hear you constantly reinforcing this because I think it really is an important topic that needs to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. I think the prep work is really key. So taking a step back and, and thinking about, you know, what are the goals of your deployment and what are you trying to do with that technology? Mm -hmm. And then how you can align that with the customers you're trying to serve, whether that's internal or external, and then trying to connect those dots and apply it. And, and a lot of that is communication. And, and I'll be honest, a lot of it is repetitive <laughs> communication. <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you, if you say the same thing in a couple of different ways, it, it helps yeah. the message resonate. Or maybe the first time. Say in different time, ways, that don't you? Not, don't say the same thing the same way. Tweet <laughs> <laughs> that might be a little annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if the, if the first time doesn't resonate, you know, maybe the second will, or maybe the third will, or maybe somebody just needs time to get used to it. 
in some cases, that's the case as well. So, you know, being able to be flexible and work with the person on the other end and really think through communication and, and how you're saying something and what you're saying to them and how they're receiving it. And the different ways you can communicate with them is also really key. You know, we, we try a variety of different communication styles. We mm -hmm. send emails, we send things to the platform, we conduct webinars, we conduct one-on-one -on -one calls. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can engage. And we always encourage our customers to engage directly with their suppliers. At the end of the day, that's what we want to facilitate is, you know, that, that communication, that discussion about sustainability or risk management mm -hmm. and that behavior change at the end of the day that goes along with it. So enabling the communication up front really also helps enable communication to get what you want as an end result. And that's where we try to link that tie. Wow. Very cool. What have, what have you guys found of some of the biggest challenges internally and both for your customers as, as part of kind of the COVID situation? Yeah, you know, interestingly, one of the biggest challenges is just not knowing who is deeper in your supply chain. So if you don't know who you're communicating to or where in the world they reside, <laughs> it makes it pretty difficult. Yeah. <laughs> so just getting past that first layer is, is difficult. And, you know, it's kind of surprising how many large organizations have so many suppliers and may not have, you know, an updated supplier list of who is actually supplying what to them. Mm -hmm. And so in many cases, just the process of going through your first layer of suppliers is a great foundation for driving change later on. So in many cases, that's where we start is just, you know, going through your first layer of suppliers, identifying who those folks are, identifying exactly what they supply to you, identifying where those risks are, and being able to lay that foundation. And then, of course, map that year over year in order to drive sustainable change it's incredible what well, one thing that we on our, on our podcast one thing that we always like to do is challenge our, our listeners to really expand their own comfort zones and we'll take what we call bold actions to really help their own customers achieve better results based on your experience are there any bold actions that you'd recommend customer success professionals and leaders can take to better structure their teams to evolve how they engage with customers that they're working with in a highly niche field that requires this very specific industry knowledge. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, I'll start with an example. So when I started my career in HR and I was working as a recruiter, a senior recruiter had pointed out to me that recruiting is actually really similar to sales and marketing. So you represent your company, you have to be really persistent, you have to find the right person, you have to use psychology um, in order to make sure that you're keeping your best talent engaged. So if you apply that notion to diversity and how folks think about diversity, you know, there's a lot of proof that diverse companies make for stronger and more resilient, financially successful companies and, and affect the bottom line. So when you apply both of those things to customer success, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be learned from others' experiences in an organization. So the first thing that I always challenge leaders to do is building strong internal connections so that you can learn from your peers and your fellow leaders. And then when you're constructing your team, really challenge yourself to think about how a diverse team with a wide range of experiences and a wide set of skills can really help your business bottom line. Because even when you have a really niche industry, we all have a common human experience and you can really turn that to your advantage for your team and for your customers. Wow, I love that. And I think even more so in customer success, that that diversity and range of experiences just from all across different industries, different functions, and uh, you know, even different countries where people have worked, the different cultures that people are working with really adds to what you can bring to your customers. Yep, that is fantastic. Any other, any other last thoughts that you think would help people as, as they go forward in, in their careers and customer success? Yeah, you know, that, that's really my goal in terms of, you know, being a leader in customer success and, and helping to create better experiences for my customers is really to take a broad view um, and, and understand who's on the other side of the table and, and what makes them tick um, and how we can apply our, our diverse experiences to what they're trying to accomplish. So that's really our goal. And, and I hope that that helps when other people customer success folks are trying to achieve their goals as well. Fantastic. Well, Shanta, thank you so much for, for being with us. I, I tell you, I really enjoyed our conversation the other day and, and really uh, value what you're doing and the contribution that you're bringing. And thank you so much. And I highly uh, encourage people to reach out to you if you have 
uh, questions about diversity in HR and customer success and how it can fit in there. Cause I think you've got a lot of knowledge to share and a lot of gifts and a lot of great experience. So thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Really Appreciate enjoyable it. conversation. Thank you. Take care.